What I have brought tonight is a, a lot of graphs because I, I'm a, a keen believer in um, a pictures worth a thousand words, and so I've got quite a number of pictures to illustrate um, what I'm going to be talking through tonight. Um, and as I was saying before I, I started off, uh, my objective to this evening is to um, present to you a, uh, a case which is so absolutely water and airtight that you all walk out of it at the end of the evening and think, I know everything I need to know about demographics, and I'm really quite concerned about it. So um, I'm going to have to work with two of these. We'll see if we can get going. Killing us softly. Um, I think economists and so social thinkers have been thinking for many, many years uh, about demographics, what's going on, and what's, is, is it really as, as important as, as all that. I personally believe that it is. I think that actually, if we look at a, a really basic life cycle economics about what's going on, the productivity of, of a populace times the number of people working really equals your GDP, particularly if you take inflation out of it. And if you start to, to reduce the number of people who are working, your GDP is going to fall. And we're going to see some, some stuff. I've done some, some forecasting about all of that and what's going on. So it really does uh, at some time, sometimes become that simple. I've, I've been in lots of conversations in the last few, few days. And, and in fact, uh, I think there was some of you who were at the uh, presentation I went to yesterday with, with um, uh, Paul Tucker of the Bank of England. And we were having a discussion about that. And he said, what's the trend rate of growth in the United Kingdom? And we were having a, an interesting discussion. And somebody said, is it down to 1%? And uh, as we'll see in my, my presentation, I said, Actually, it seems that we are at an inflection point in demographics, and the bad news is that it could be 1% if we don't do anything. And Paul Tucker said, well, actually, you know, we looked at it in the last few years, and it's, it doesn't seem to be coming true. The, what, de what demographics is suggesting should happen hasn't come through yet. And my view was, yeah, but these are big, long-term shifts. I don't care if it doesn't come through last year or this year, it doesn't mean it's, you know, we're going to create more people of working age. We're just not going to do that. So anyway, we're going to come through lots of things uh, tonight, and um, hopefully I will be uh, through and, and give lots of time for uh, questions as we come through as well. Um, one of the things as an economist that I really like about demographics, uh, and Michael was alluding to it, was, was just how predictable it really is. I mean, as an economist, you, you get a, a constant reminder of um, just how much um, humility you should have in any forecast that you might be giving. Because, of course, um, we've all been giving these forecasts and said, I'm, I'm absolutely hand on heart certain this is going to be the case, and it just doesn't quite work out in the way in which you like. Demographics is great, because for the most part, it, it's more predictable than many other uh, parts of, of the economy, and certainly economic indicators that have come on. Um, so, so we'll go on, and we'll look at some of the things that are demographic. So where are we now? Um, I like this map because, of course, it gives an idea of if the world was uh, organized in the size of uh, your populace as opposed to um, uh, geographically, this is the size of, of the countries. And you can see um, the country that I was born in, Canada, really pretty small, the UK much, much bigger than that, which probably tells you why Mark Carney is going from Canada to the United Kingdom. Um, because actually, from a population point of view, of course, the UK is more important. And then other countries, which haven't done so well in turning the large number of people into uh, more productive um, uh, parts of their economy. So you look at in India, parts of Africa, um, and we'll be talking about some of those in just, just a little bit a, as well. Um, so where are we now? I'm going to go through a few concepts here just to, to really introduce you to some of the things that de demographics are looking at, uh, and then we're going to start to, to look more at some of the um, uh, implications of all that as well. These are some pretty standard charts that are given. Uh, do we have a pointer? Is, is there a pointer thing? I mean? I, I'm sure I can, I can make. These are... are uh, in this case, it's always uh, the males on the side, the females on the side, slightly different colors. You see there's the children and then the retirees. And what, what this shows you is the way in which the world, these four here and the UK over on that side, you can see the way in which things have grown. Over the last years, the world in 1950, 2010, so right about now, 2050 and 2100. You can see how much fatter we're getting. So when people say to you, you know, we know that there's more old people in the world, that, that the dependency ratio is rising, it clearly is. Um, you can see, in a, in a, if we look, look at the extreme here, the number of people who are both old and young, depending upon the number of people who are working, has increased quite markedly. And you can see why when people started to divide, uh, design the original welfare state way up here um, in 1950, it all worked. There weren't very many old people. You could be really generous with them. Um, if we move to now, we've got a bit of a problem. If we move to 2050, we've got a lot of a problem. Um, and by the way, you can see also here, oh, good, I, I'm mic'd up. You can see over here, um, this obviously is the world, and you don't really see the, the effect of the war, but you can see the effect of the war here very, very clearly. The effect of the war is not, in fact, um, one of people getting killed. It's really of babies not being born. So you can see clearly a little tick in there uh, of the, uh, the, the deaths, but the much bigger um, uh, 
push is in um, a few years later, which is, of course, the fact that lots of people were away and unable to uh, start families, and that's a bigger uh, kick effect. And we'll see that the implications of that uh, as we go on uh, over the next uh, few minutes. So um, if we look and say, okay, that's, that's where we are. How many people are we having? What's, what's happening to the fertility rates uh, going on in here? So here we've got global fertility and GDP. This is, this is sometimes called the, the fertility paradox because, of course, um, as you become richer, you should be able to afford more children. And clearly, as you become richer, you don't. Um, as you become richer, you have many, many fewer children. So you can see down here um, the, the number of children and the income uh, of people. And it doesn't surprise any you know, what, what intuitively might be the case we all know in practice isn't. Uh, and you can see a lot of very, very poor countries. Clearly, they're having children both uh, as an insurance uh, policy uh, against old age. They're having a lot of children because um, uh, they, they, they may or may not have um, a good uh, health care and, and other things, so a lot of those children will be dying. Lots of reasons why. I think the interesting things to happen that are coming out of this are, uh, number one, if you look at places like Hong Kong, by the way, Singapore is not here, which is the sort of the other city-state that we want to look at. But if you look at Hong Kong, very, very, very low fertility there. Um, much, much lower than you might expect. The UK, EU, um, pretty average. Uh, USA, a little bit higher. Um, some of the data from the US is a little bit skewed because, of course, they don't separate it out uh, to, to different groups. If you looked at um, the US in terms of um, uh, long-term indigenous population as opposed to newer immigrants, you get a much, much lower uh, birth rate there. So the US being skewed slightly by the fact that they've had a large immigration um, coming through on all of that. Um, What's also interesting is the way in which, uh, I've not got a chart on this, but um, you look at the number of births per, per woman, and actually, they've all been falling. The, the um, European Union and uh, the US, uh, the, the long-term indigenous population in the US, around about 11 per thousand in a five-year period. So around about, just, a, just around two, two children per woman. Um, and there was a, a period of time around 2000 when this was thought to be actually getting quite a bit worse. And you looked at it and you saw countries like Italy down at 1.3%, people well, well below uh, um, uh, reproduction level and all sorts of, of, of uh, straight line forecasts. I personally dislike straight line forecasts intensely. I think a lot of economists do them. Um, I've even seen some economists manage to sell straight line forecasts, which always amazes me that anyone would buy something that's simplistic. That's simplistic. But um, people were, were saying things like, well, within a, a, um, a few decades, we're going to see Germany being larger than Russia. And you think, well, uh, it's not quite as simple as that. What we do seem to have seen is that um, a fair number of women have um, delayed childbirth. And so I think we probably w lived through a period in which uh, women got on with their careers, and they are having their children, they're just having them about five to 10 years later than the generation before them. So we have some, some, evidence, uh, some evidence of that. And um, you can see there the, the point that I put forward that in um, 2003, 21 countries had 1.3%. It's only five now. So we're seeing a bit of a lift up that. But in any case, what we are seeing is a real convergence on, on the number of children that people are having. So we've got a, a, a much more steadying demographic. And I've got some data which I'll, I'll touch upon later, which goes and shows you the number of people in, in the world. Um, and we are now at, at a number of, of turning points. As I said, the, the, the one in the UK of what's happening to a working age population. Another turning point that we happen to be at right now is that for the very first time, it's taking longer to achieve the next one billion people in the world than it has taken at any point up until now in human history. So we're actually seeing uh, a lengthening. It was uh, for the first billion people took, um, uh, from moving from one to two uh, billion people, took 123 years most recently. I, I can't remember the numbers. We'll come on to them in a moment. But it is actually starting to lengthen out. So that's what's happened to your fertility. As Michael said, um, demographics is about more than just populations. It's also about looking at you know, how rich are people, where's the money, what, what are they demanding from us? And we start to, to uh, now look at concepts which become very, very interesting from an economic point of view and what we're doing with all of this. So here we have um, a life cycle consumption. Now, this is a, a chart which I took from the uh, Bureau of, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research in the US. So it is obviously for the US. And uh, the one thing that I think immediately what will strike many of you is um, this isn't terribly believable, uh, is that everybody lives to 90. Um, clearly, some people, unfortunately, will be passing away before they reach the 90th birthday. So it isn't um, accurate to simply look at this and project it out and think that's the spending the government's going to have to do. It's not quite as bad as all that. However, it does give you an idea of the sorts of things that are going on with the life cycle. Um, I think there's more to life cycle economics than simply this chart, clearly. Um, one of them has been, and I used to say this to my, my students at the, uh, the LSE all the time, I love economics, and I love uh, looking at economics. And a lot of it is about um, taking how you behave 
and writ large. And you've probably got a reasonable idea of the sorts of things that people uh, will, will want to do. So for instance, um, if you're in your late 20s, early 30s, you're probably establishing a home. It's probably an expensive time for you. You may you know, children, an expensive thing for you. Um, by the time you're in your 40s and 50s, hopefully you're at your peak earning years, and you're probably thinking about things like your pension for the first time. So, and that's what's been happening. And so, of course, what we've been enjoying in, in the US and the UK in the last few years has been the peak years, really. And what we're seeing now is the falling away. And you can see there, um, now we always know that, that health care spending in the US is particularly problematic for them, but it's, it's not that much easier for those of us in Europe. Um, and you can see the, the quite considerable rise in the amount of public health. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that we know that the dependency ratio is rising. The dependency ratio is the number of people who are depending upon um, in one way or another, whether they be children or old people, uh, depending upon those of us still in work. So the question becomes, uh, if you have too many people depending upon not enough workers, can you continue to afford it? Um, and it may well be that you could say, well, the people are going to vote for it. You don't have a choice. Uh, at the same time, um, I would say you can't create money out of nothing, but of course the Bank of England is proving me wrong on that all the time. Um, but <laughs> the fact is, it can, you, you, you can uh, have a populace which demands things which simply become unaffordable, and at some point it all becomes unstuck, and if you'd like to see evidence of that, you simply need to ask the Greeks. So, that said, let's start to move into where we are now. Here we have um, the UK working age population. Um, now, this is uh, stuff, oh, this is all from the uh, United Nations Population Database, a, a database I've, I've long liked, and in fact, I have to say they've made better and better over the years. It's really very, very good. And they've got, here's your work, UK working age population. I'll, I'll come around. So this is between 15 and 64, which is what they call the working age population. Now, clearly, um, a lot of us would, wouldn't think that 15-year-olds necessarily are pouring into the, into the job market, but it, it will tell us some interesting things. So here we are, the, the, the number starts to tick up in about 1970. So in reality, we've got about 1960. Remember when Harold, Harold Macmillan said, you've never had it so good? Well, actually, a lot of people seem to um, think that was the, the truth, and they started producing families, much, much bigger. In the US, for instance, and we'll see this in a moment, it started quite a bit earlier because, of course, the prosperity, the post-war prosperity in the US took hold probably about 10 years before that uh, seen in, uh, in Europe. And um, so anyway, we can see the, the working age population start to go up here. And it really goes up uh, until uh, this is about the, the late 1960s when um, all sorts of different societal changes come into it, and that's when it starts to, to level off. Importantly, whether, whether people actually started working at 15 is, is, is uh, not, not a concern here, but what is a concern is, if you look at where we are now, 20, 2013, that's about where we, we start to see that steep decline. And we've got different variants here. And these variants depend upon things like emigration. They depend upon, some, in some degree, fertility. But everybody's agreeing on one thing. And if you remember, one of the reasons I love demographics is because it's actually much more predictable than almost any other part of economics. We already know what the, the, the population is. Now, we've, we've actually seen in the UK um, one of the biggest periods of, of net immigration we've ever experienced in this country. It's been politically quite controversial. Uh, it's probably difficult to see it happening again. But the fact is, that's the sort of decline that we're going to be seeing going forward. So what's all of that going to mean for us? Because clearly, it's one thing to say well, we've got a, a decline. Um, it's another thing to, to start to, to predict some of the things coming out of that. So here's your working age population, productivity versus GDP. Now, if you mom remember a moment ago, I talked about the whole idea of um, uh, an economy growth in very, very simplistic terms. It was your productivity plus how many people were working. Now, if we see in the, the previous chart, if your economy is growing as it was, um, the number of people coming into the economy, whether they be because the indigenous population has got more people entering the workforce, or because um, uh, you've got immigration, you've got a, a very positive effect coming through here. It's not the whole story by any means. Most of the story is about people getting more productive in their work. And we, we know that people have a, a trend rate of productivity that people, all of us, get better at our work by about 2% a year. Um, but the trend rate of growth in the UK has been about 2.5%. And you can look at that quite clearly. You can see that I've added together the, the productivity uh, and the population growth, and then compared it against the GDP. Now, the GDP is, is a, um, a figure generally derived out of a VAT receipt, so it's a consumption figure. And the productivity and the, and the population is, is a, um, uh, an output measure. So you can see the two match pretty, pretty well, uh, as you'd expect. Um, as you'd expect. So many times in economics, what you expect doesn't actually happen. But in this case, it was, it was rather gratifying that you could see quite clearly the two were um, very, very closely correlated. And if you said, well, what's productivity? 
and it's about 20%. Uh, sorry, uh, the productivity is 80%. So 20% of the growth that we've seen over the long term has been due to the fact that we've got an expanding population. So big, not the whole story, big, uh, important. Um, and more recently, we've, we've had the last few years where, where, as you saw in the previous chart, um, we've reached something of a plateau. Um, and so we weren't seeing a growing working age population. Um, we were just sort of muddling through. But I think there's also been bigger issues uh, within the economy as a whole. So the um, last five years have clearly been uh, pretty, pretty dramatic um, for those of us in the financial sector, for everybody else in the, the economy as a whole. Um, and I don't think you've probably seen the demographic uh, implications being at the forefront of what's been driving the economy uh, going forward from, from there. So th there we've got uh, some idea of what's been happening in the UK. What's been happening in the rest of the developed world? Well, you'll see cl clearly here, um, pretty similar, really. Um, you can see the, the baby boom, and it comes at different places for different people. Um, but es essentially, the, the effect of the war, and if you remember those charts, those sort of bulging charts I showed you earlier uh, about the, the fact that children hadn't been born because men were largely away, um, that was really, really been driving an enormous amount of um, uh, demographics across uh, the, the, all of the European uh, Union. It's interesting, I, I haven't put it up here, but uh, if you look at countries like Ireland and Sweden where there wasn't a war, uh, or the, where, they, where they weren't in the war, um, they're very, very different. They're much, much flatter. They haven't experienced the same sort of of, of gyrations going on with all of that. So, um, and you can see again the US taking off this sort of orange colored line. Uh, it starts to expand a, a bit before everybody else does. Um, and the key to all of this, of course, was um, not the return of soldiers. If you look at the actual data in the 1945 46, there's a little bit of a spike up as you know, the, the boys got home and immediately started to produce families. But the real thing is, is all about economic prosperity. So, um, it, people felt good and they started to abuse children in a way that they just hadn't beforehand. So what's happening in the rest of the world? Well, here we have BRICS. Um, I'm not just sure that BRICS are necessarily the best explanation of, of uh, emerging markets, but they're the one that everybody seems to use, and Jim O'Neill is making sure that we all remember it was he who, who put it forward. Anyway, we got the BRICS, and I put the, the world here just, just to show you um, what, how they, they produce in, in, uh, against that. Um, Demographics have been a really, really positive boost for them as well. I'll just uh, digress very, very briefly on one country in particular because it's, I think it's extremely interesting. Ireland. Ireland, as I said, didn't go into, um, uh, we all know, didn't go into the Second World War, um, but uh, when it left uh, the United Kingdom in 1922, they went into more or less a, um, a very, very long-term recession. Pretty, 1922 to, one can argue, to 1982. A couple of generations of very, very poor economic growth. And during that time, they saw uh, enormous amounts of um, uh, net emigration away from the country. Um, eventually, eventually, they got their act together, and they started to have uh, what was obviously known as the Celtic Tiger, and they did very, very well. It's interesting looking at that as they grew, because um, one of the things that the Celtic Tiger really, really helped on was they started to have a demographic boom. And if you look at what Ireland did during that period of time, they had an uh, enormous number of young people entering the workforce. Now. We know that you can have an enormous number of young people entering the workforce and not do anything and, and underperform economically. Um, and we've got examples of that. I mean, I think the most depressing case, to be honest, in, in the world is Egypt, where the population growth is, is rapidly outstripping any ability to um, uh, provide for them economically, with the result that actually they're getting much, much poorer, almost um, uniquely poorer amongst countries that once were uh, sort of middle ranking. Um, but Ireland has done very, very well. And we'll come back onto that uh, in, in a few moments as to the, the sort of hierarchy of how countries expand when they, when they finally get things right. Anyway, back to the emerging markets. We can see here. Now, if you remember, is it, yep, here. Fairly, fairly dramatic falls, but nothing, but nothing like the dramatic falls that we're seeing here. Now, a lot of people who, who go looking at the emerging markets will tell you pretty quickly, you know, one of the reasons that, that people who are um, very positive about India in comparison to particularly places like China, one of the reasons they are positive about that is because of the demographics. And you can see here that sort of purple line being, being India and the steep falling, collapsing line being China. Now that's about 1% a year for China. That's, uh, well, the working age population drops by half of 1% and so it goes from a positive half to a negative half, so 1% drop a year. Now if you're growing at 11, 12% and somebody says we're well, dropping half a percent, well, it's not that big a deal, is it? But everybody is also expecting China to be growing. And in fact, there are arguments right now that the Chinese government is trying to, to get a broader range of growth and therefore is pushing or holding growth back on purpose um, for part of a, a bigger plan. 
and that they're aiming at sort of 6% growth. And all of a sudden, if you are seeing a working age population falling by 1%, 1% off 6 is a lot bigger than 1% off 12. So China is facing a demographic problem of really catastrophic proportions. Um, and um, along with that, they've got a whole, whole trend of, of urbanization, a real moving of, of, of the, the poor into, um, into the cities. So some, some big, big things happening within the, uh, the working age population as well. So I've described a lot of problems. I wanted to come on to some of these solutions. Um, it's not all inevitable. Uh, and um, the, the, the stuff I've said, you know, the, the falling number of people, that, that I think pretty much is inevitable. But we can do things about them. They're just not terribly easy things to do. And there will be some painful things. And undoubtedly, some of you will pick me up in the questions and say, yes, yes, but this really isn't possible. We can't, because it's just going to, too many people will be hurt and too many people won't vote for it. And thinking, right, well, if you want to create more people to, to be workers, that's fantastic. And then we can, we can come around to solutions. Anyway, what can we do? One is to retire later. We'll come on to that in a second. <laughs> yep. Uh, one is to improve aut automation and productivity. Uh, we can improve our workforce participation rates. We can improve the workforce flexibility in what we do. And finally, we can accept stagnation. Um, and before, we, of course, we said, well, we don't want to accept stagnation. Of course, that is the choice the Japanese have made. And if you ask, ask which country has been the first into this demographic, sort of testing just to see what it's like to live in a country with 1% growth for two decades because nobody's willing to admit the past mistakes have been made. And by the way, the economy or the, the population isn't growing. It's Japan. Let's be clear, Japan is still a rich country. People still live quite good lives there, but it isn't one that's growing. And there'll be all sorts of consequences of that as well. So let's just look quickly at what the UK would look like if we didn't do anything. So as I said, if you remember before, I had that chart which looked at uh, population growth plus productivity growth and said, that's, that's it, and then there's our GDP. And then I just took that and I said, well, let's just run that forward. Let's just say, we don't get any more productive. We don't get any less productive. Some people are saying everything's been invented that's ever been invented, which I always think is a particularly stupid type of uh, approach. Let's just say we continue with the same rate of productivity growth that we've had in the last 20 years, in the next 20 years. I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of, of whenever we want to look forward 20 or 30 years, you look back 20 or 30 years. It gives you a framework in which to um, set everything together. Because um, oftentimes people can, get, can either think that you know, we're all going to be traveling around in spacesuits and standing around in t-shirts like Star Trek, um, or they can say nothing's going to change at all. Um, it, I think it's, it's a good, good uh, metric, and it's, it's one that they often use at the World Economic Forum at Davos, and I, I think it's, it's good. Anyway, 2.5% growth, which was sort of our 1960 to um, even including the recession we've had just now, and then what's going to go forward? Well, that's 0.8%. That's sort of what we've had in the last couple of years. That sort of feels like a recession. I mean, it's not a recession. A recession is, theoretically, the economy is becoming smaller. But 0.8%, as I think we all know from first-hand experience, doesn't feel terribly comfortable. We don't like it very much. It means that, for instance, the, the rate of growth of the economy is lower than the rate of, of um, productivity increase that most people are able to produce in their jobs. It means that you'll feel constantly like, I need a pay rise, and I'm not getting one. Um, it's that sort of thing. So we thought, this is if we do nothing. <clears throat> Um, and the other thing about low, low rates of growth is they make industrial transformation pretty difficult. One of the things that um, I think is really positive about if we see, for instance, um, the way in which IT has come into India and places like that, is that old ways of doing things are changed by new industries coming into an economy. And um, if you don't have new industries coming in, um, it's much more difficult to undertake those, those sorts of transformations. So, that's, that's the sort of down, downside. So what are some of the things we can do to potentially get around that? The first one, of course, is retire later. Um, this is something that both the last government and this government um, have been working upon. Um, some of you may recall that the Labour government decided that um, uh, the absurd situation in which women both lived longer and retired earlier than men uh, was um, being reversed, and they were going to equalize the retirement age and then raise it. Unfortunately, they decided in order to make sure that nobody was ever hurt by this, they would take four decades to do it, um, which is probably somewhat longer than I would have done it if um, James Spurl the Radical had been in charge. Anyway, um, that said, it's not the be-all and the end-all here, because I wanted to, to in, look at this, and I was looking back at Lord Turner's report of, gosh, about six or seven years ago now, uh, and, and seeing what's the evidence of this, retiring later. It helps, but it's not the answer. It's not the whole answer, certainly. And you can see there, Here's the, the old age. Um, and you can see what happens if you get people to retire and you move the, the retirement age up. It's, it's better. Not as, the dependency ratio isn't as high, but it's not 
going to be the solution to this whole problem. Also, by the way, very interesting to see the number of children. So the, the, the long-term projections are the number of children to remain, uh, as we were discussing earlier. It's moved up to about the replace, replacement rate, and it just sits there. Most families, two children, pretty, pretty normal. Um, so here we've got um, a, a clearly a rising dependency ratio, and it's rising because people, people are old. Um, the coalition government has now set a, a new plan, which is to, uh, for the first time, and this is only in discussion, it's not been obviously put through, to link people's retirement age, they don't actually have an official retirement age anymore, but to try to link people's retirements to their longevity. So we're, we're going to be encouraged uh, to actually continue to work and to not have a um, fixed date, date at which you retire, but to probably have some sort of a fixed date of the number of years that we would uh, seek in retirement, so say the last 10 years or whatever. Um, the one thing that that moving the retirement age up does do. It doesn't affect the dependency ratio so much, but it does mean that the, the retirement pots, the amount of money you're able to save, is, is much, much better because, of course, you've both got fewer years to depend upon that pot, pot of money and more years to contribute to it. So there are some, some, some bigger benefits to it that aren't necessarily shown in this, um, in this chart. So if we're going to retire later um, and we've got a problem, maybe we could be, all be a bit more productive. Um, maybe we could actually do more. Um, and... Uh, I think the immediate answer, immediate thing there is that the UK certainly has scope for that. Uh, many of these things um, I, I looked at and said, um, there's, a, there's not much scope to improve things here. There's a lot of scope to improve the UK. If you look there on the um, chart here, the UK is the, the flat line, everybody's in comparison. The UK got more productive as everybody else collapses down um, between 1990, sort of around 2006, 2007, and since then it's steadied out. Um, but we're down there with, with Canada and Italy, um, but we're some way below France, Germany, and the U.S. So um, clearly there's probably a, uh, a lot to, to do there, and, and it's, it's well beyond the, the scope of this particular um, lecture to go into all of that, but there is clearly scope for that. I think looking at it, um, there's hope as well, because down here, one of the things that we've looked about productivity, and I was always taught as, uh, way back when, when I was doing my, my undergraduate and then my master's degree, that... Um, uh, the, the, it was much easier to, to gain productivity increases when you were talking about manufacturing because, of course, people got better at manufacturing. Services, very, very difficult. Um, and, of course, it was um, uh, Professor Robert Solow in 87, who, 1987 said, you could see computers everywhere except the productivity st statistics. Uh, I'm not sure that's actually true anymore. Here we've got the total services productivity increases in the whole economy in the UK, uh, and that's manufacturing. So either the, the data's dodgy, um, I don't think so, it's from the ONS, or actually we've gotten a lot better at giving some sort of service sector productivity. Now, some of that is due to the fact that we're doing um, uh, more uh, outsourcing. Some of it is due to actually the IT revolution has taken longer to uh, affect than most people would anticipate. Um, one of my favorite quips is, is by Bill Gates, who said that the, the IT revolution is both uh, overestimated in the, uh, let me get this right, it underestimated in, in the long term and overestimated in the short term. So people think that IT things will, will really, really affect them quickly. They don't. But they also do really affect you in the longer term. And it takes a long time for companies to figure out how to use IT effectively. And I think that's really the case in a lot of the service industries coming through and, and all of that. So um, if, if we seem to have overcome the, the idea that service sector productivity is, is difficult, um, what are some of the other implications of that? I think productivity, I've got two slides on that one because it's a uh, particularly important um, uh, area for me. Um, so what have we got here? And I think this is also extraordinarily important, uh, particularly this, this chart here, because um, one of the things we'll also hear is, well, you know, older people, they're not so productive. And, uh, you know, how is the economy gonna, going to respond to, to older people? And in fact, if we look at, I've just set this 1993 to 100 on this thing, we look, what's the productivity by age? Actually, 50 plus is doing really well. The people that aren't, aren't so productive are, are your youth. Um, now, for those of us who are a bit older, a bit more cynical, that might ring true. Um, but actually, it, the, data, the data backs that up, and I thought it was extre extremely interesting what's been happening there. Um, and we've got a, on the top one uh, over there, the um, education level and the productivity. And surprise, surprise, uh, those with the more education tend to be more productive. And, and that's, I, I think, um, been the case for a very, very long time and certainly will continue on. One of the things about um, the retirement age, uh, which probably uh, reflects both in these charts and, and the previous ones, is that um, we talk about people retiring and what age they retire, and traditionally 65. Of course, one of the things that we've had over the last 
20 odd years has been many people taking early retirement. Um, that I think as a trend is probably going to be reversed quite, quite quickly. And um, the, uh, the reason that one might want to raise it from 65 to 70 or more very, very, very rapidly is because actually the, the, the anticipated age that people say 65 and then if they get to 50, uh, say 55, they think, well, I feel slightly guilty about retiring. But by 60, they're thinking, okay, um, maybe I can retire now. Um, if we raised it to 70, the, the hope, um, I think, for many people, including myself, would be they'll at least work until 65. Right now, they're not even working to 65. Um, and I think we've got a, a chart later that shows the earnings uh, capacity and all of that. So um, part of the reason to, to delay is just to, to get people to, to push it back uh, at, at some way. Okay, so if we're, not going to, if, we're, if we're going to become a bit more productive, a bit better educated, thankfully older workers do seem to be, seem to be very productive, um, a bigger service sector economy certainly helps with productivity. Older workers have a much easier time with the service sector economy and being productive within that economy. What are some of the other things we could do? Well, one of them is to uh, improve workforce participation rates. I've not looked at unemployment here because I think unemployment is a figure that tends to get skewed, not so much in the UK, but I mean, wildly skewed in parts of Europe. Um, and it's actually better. And what we're really concerned about here is not unemployment. We're concerned about how many people are out there working to produce stuff to keep the economy going. Because what we're worried about is the number of people within the working age population. And so we'll look at the, the um, uh, employment rates. And we can see, we all know that Germany's having a, a very good time uh, economically in the last few years. And you can see the German um, employment rate going up there quite, quite markedly. And the UK being pretty high already. Um, so in the UK, employment held up remarkably well in the last few years, despite the fact of the recession. It's one of the, the, the curious things about this, this downturn has been many economists, including myself, would have predicted much higher um, uh, unemployment to come up. But companies have been slow to restructure, and that slow to restructure has, has at least had the advantage of um, keeping lots of people in employment. So um, looking at the uh, employment rates and what's going on with all of that, and it's unsurprisingly, countries like Greece have... I've stuck them not obviously because they're major, but because it can show you what ha happens when things go very, very badly wrong. From, from a not terribly uh, heroic level of about 58%, uh, they're now down to about 54% of the people employed within the country. And that, that's pretty appalling. Um, what's, what have governments looked at in all of this? What are, what are governments focused upon? Um, governments tend to be focused upon long-term unemployed. And there's all sorts of reasons why you would want to focus on long-term unemployed as a, as a politician. However, I want to make the argument that actually that's probably the wrong thing to focus on here because what we're really concerned about is not unemployment per se, we're concerned about getting people into the workforce and getting more people into the workforce because we've got a, a shortage of people to keep the economy going. And actually long-term unemployed are the very last people in a hierarchy of employment that you tend to, to, to find. So if we look at what happens economically as um, uh, companies grow within, within an, uh, an area, the first people that they hire are those who've been unemployed for a short period of time. Short-term uh, unemployed, they, they haven't been, uh, d they're not discouraged workers, they've probably got a lot of relevant skills, they're out there looking all the time, they get jobs. Who's next? New to the labor force is actually next. It's easier to attract a housewife, fresh student, somebody like that, to come into the workforce who hadn't considered working and now thinks, well, actually, there's good opportunities here, I'll come into the workforce. The next in the queue, and this is really starting to stretch it, tends to be immigrants. So I'd much prefer to employ immigrants than long-term unemployed. And particularly if the immigrant has some sort of a connection. Now, a lot of this data that I was looking at comes from studies that uh, I did a number of years ago on uh, the Irish economy. And clearly they had a diaspora that left. That diaspora came home before they started to employ long-term unemployed. And only once, the, in the Irish case, the, the boom had been going about eight years did they start to employ. You see any real movement in the long-term unemployed. That type of a hierarchy of employment gives you an idea of how difficult it is to, to employ long-term unemployed. So my, my encouragement for, for governments and policymakers here would be you can have programs for the long-term unemployed for all sorts of good socioeconomic reasons, but don't think that's going to be the thing that solves the problem of the, the, the demographic problem. The demographic problem should be a, addressed through a different thing, which is to get more people employed and probably not all the focus is upon um, the, the workforce participation rates. Finally, um, let's look at uh, getting some uh, improved workforce flexibility. I think there's two things that need to come, come through here. And a lot of uh, people have talked about uh, employers and the way in which they need to, to get with the picture and employ older people. Um, B and Q, of course, is, is the forefront of this, but, but who else 
can we point to and say, that's a company that really wants to employ people, um, older people within the economy. Not that many have really focused upon it. I think that that's absolutely true. Um, but I think there's more than that. And I think the other thing is employers, or sorry, the employees need to start to look at that. And they don't, um, the idea that people have some sort of uh, long, slow, gradual increase in their in income to the age of 65 um, is wrong. It's going to have to change. And people have to start to say, actually, towards the end of my career, I have a variety of, of incomes or, or of jobs, and I'm not paid as much at the age of 65 as I was at 55. That's the way it goes. It doesn't mean you're not going to be paid anything. It doesn't mean that you're not a productive member of society. It just means that people have to get used to a cycle, which means um, up and down. Gordon Brown should, should remember that when no more boom and bust in his economic cycles. It means both. It means up and down. And that's probably the sort of thing that's going to happen. So that's one thing that's going to come through in all of this. The second thing is, if we're looking for people to keep the economy going because there's not enough wealth being created, because there's not enough people to do it, there is a, a, another part of the economy which could, um, somewhat more controversially, be tapped to supply some of that. And that is the public sector, which, as you can see here, has grown quite considerably. It has shrunk down in the last couple of years, um, but it's still employing about 25% of people in the country are employed in the public sector. Now, if the, the economy as a whole isn't generating enough money, one has to look at what and how are we going to shift people around to make sure that they are, um, uh, the economy as a whole is generating that wealth. Rather than consuming the wealth through, through taxation and therefore paying into the public sector, there is an argument to say, look, people can be shifted from less productive to more productive jobs in, in that manner. So, moving towards my conclusion, um, what are we going to do? We can plan to retire later, which I think we should certainly do. We can drive up productivity, which we'd all like. It's difficult, but we'd all like to do it. We can get more people working productively, probably a good idea. We can embrace agility, or I'm not sure this cartoon really works, um, but it's saying, you know, it, or we can decide to retire in 2065, um, which is to say we can enjoy a much, much lower standard of living. Now, um, I'm here at Gresham College, and I'm here in the city of London, and I thought just before I, I, I conclude, I'm going to come on to um, uh, one particular area which I find very, very interesting. Uh, which I think is, is really relevant to those of us who live in London, and is a big, big demographic trend. When I was doing all of the reading for this, uh, for this lecture and, and putting it all together, um, uh, one of the big factors that people were looking at um, and saying that this is going to be changing is urbanization. I love this chart. Uh, it's not a chart, it's, sorry, uh, it's a picture. It's taken by NASA at night, and it shows the world at night. And so you can see where people are, and you can see you know, how much people are, are becoming urbanized. And the, the one thing I'll point out quickly, for those of you who haven't, I think probably most of you have seen it, it's, um, it's not that clear a, a picture. You can look it up on the net very quickly yourselves or, or when, the, when all this um, presentation comes out on, um, on the Gresham website. If you look at Japan there, and then obviously you see South Korea, and then you see that blank part north of it. That's North Korea. So um, clearly they're not an area blessed with a lot of urbanization, nor blessed with a lot of, a lot of electricity. Um, but what we're seeing here is, is, is urbanization. So what, what's, what's been happening? Well, in 1800, about 3% of the people in the world lived in, in urban areas, so not many. I mean, London was obviously here, it had been around since Roman times, but not many people lived in cities, most of them were rural. Today, it's about 50% of people live in, in urban areas. Um, and currently, there's 23 uh, cities with um, uh, more than 10 million in populace. Um, by 2025, it's estimated by the UN that that'll be about um, 37 cities, so quite, quite a considerable uh, increase in the number of them. The first city with more than a million people in the world was, we're here, uh, it's London, but 1811. Uh, and, and we were the biggest. We're still the biggest in Europe. And I, there is a, a bit of um, artificiality to that, of course, because if you look at, and you can see there very clearly on, on our map, um, when they talk about London's population, of course, they just talk about the metropolitan boroughs. And we all know that you know, London doesn't stop the M25. It spills over, and you could quite quite uh, convincingly argue that essentially the whole southeast of England is a city called London, and um, certainly you know, near, near parts of the home counties and, um, uh, are all London. But the, you know, we, we, we're dealing with that, that type of thing happens in lots of other places as well. Um, and today there's about 456 cities in the world with more than a million people, um, and 1.4 billion people live in, cities with, in those cities with more than a million people. And, um, this is, the, I think, the really the key, key factor here. 600 urban centers with 20% of the world's population generate 60% of the global GDP, 
what we're seeing is the power of cluster effects. Now, cluster effects are something I find extraordinarily interesting about why do industries cluster? We, we happen to be sitting, of course, in, in the cluster of, of financial services here within London, but we can look at lots of others. Why is Northern Italy so good at shoes? You know, why are there other parts of the world that are really, really good at, you can see in everything from furniture manufacturing to textiles to different parts of the world get very good. Lots of people would love to have Silicon Valley. It happens that you know, a part just outside San Francisco is one of the world's leading technical, technical areas for invention, for entrepreneurship. Those sorts of things. Very, very interesting stuff happening with all of that. So I think the, the urbanization has been one of the real growing trends. And um, if when we're looking at demographic effects coming, uh, coming forward and all of the, the negative stuff I've put forward and all of the, the things I've said about how um, uh, you know, we've got to, to really reform ourselves. Those of us in London, provided that we can continue to have London as being one of the, the world's two, Michael just gave me the latest statistics on um, global financial centers. As long as we're one of the, the two or even three big global financial centers, I think our uh, outlook in London is, is pretty positive. So, let's conclude. Demographics aren't destiny. What I've, what I've set out tonight isn't actually set in stone, but it's probably a pretty good guess as to what's the sort of thing that happen, that's happening. It's a, a noteworthy determinant. It, it's possible to overcome demographics, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, on present, I think our trend rate of growth in the UK is going to be less than 1% unless we do something. And 1% doesn't feel very comfortable. Uh, that really brings up a whole question, do we need growth? And there are lots of people who question, you know, they say, well, actually, if we, you know, they'd be perfectly happy without growth. Uh, I remember getting into a debate when I was a student about all of this um, with, with a member of the Green Party who said, um, you know, the government's got to encourage people to uh, consume less. We just need to, to, to not grow um, or to, um, you know, realize the, the, the limits of what the planet can produce. And I said, well, th this was in 1992. You'd be very, very pleased to know that at that point, the government had arranged just such a policy. Unfortunately, it was called recession and people didn't like it very much. People like growth, and the reason you like growth is both it gives you opportunities, and opportunities are one of the things that people want to see their own career, their own lives progressing. And it, if you don't have growth, that anytime somebody is progressing, it means somebody else is losing. And so you cannot have a win-win situation in a very low growth or no growth society. And that's a very, very difficult thing. Um, and so I, I, I close saying, things are, you know, there are ways to cope. They're not easy, they're not impossible. Um, not want to buy necessary heroes, but, but um, John Maynard Keynes was saying that uh, he warned the effect, that uh, the, the effect of a growing populace was likely to be over-optimism. And that's sort of what we saw through much of the post-war period. And the effect of a shrinking populace is pretty much the opposite, and particular emphasis during the period of transition. And fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that's the period we're in right now. 